Okay, before we begin, I would like to let the audience know that this past week I released the inaugural edition of my email newsletter. I have been toying with this idea for a long time to release a newsletter each week to cover some of the thoughts that I have of the week, some of the ideas, uh, to give a snapshot of the weekly podcasts, to release some interesting audio snippets, podcast outtakes that are either a little too edgy to go onto the podcast channel or doesn't actually fit into one of the existing channels. So if you received it, it's because I have your email address and I sent it to you. If you have not received it and you're considering perhaps signing up for the email newsletter and you want to maybe take it for a test drive, so you could go to my website, rabbiwobi.com, and you could scroll down a little bit till you see the newsletter, so you'll see what the inaugural edition looks like. And if that's something you want to sign up for, rabbiwobi.com forward slash newsletter, and you can sign up. You'll get it, please God, every Thursday. This week, I spoke about my thoughts on the different denominations of the Jewish people and how they can and must be reunited. So if you want to see some yeshiva-trained writing and action, I want to read you a snippet from this week's newsletter. I feel like I have visibility into both sides of this divide. I have many friends who hail from every kind of Jewish background, spanning from people who have absolutely no traditional background in Jewish learning or practice, to people who speak fluent Yiddish and study Talmud all day and know the whole Torah by heart, and who are totally immersed in the observant, religious, pious way of life. So one of the things I'm thinking about is various ways that we can reunite our people. I can assure you that at Sinai, the nation was not denominationally segregated. For us to once again achieve our peak, we must be reunited as one. Indeed, one of the hallmarks of the Messianic era is the reunification of our people. To a large extent, I think it's happening already. The polemics and the ideological battles of the 19th century are over. And in my opinion, things are trending towards consolidation. But this is definitely something to work on. So this is some of the big ideas that I want to cover, like stuff that I don't really want to do podcasts about necessarily, but things that I think are stimulating, things that are intriguing, some thoughts on the Parsha. It's going to be well worth your while, and I will strive very, very hard not to bore you, not to give you anything that you don't want or won't be interesting. Some people don't like reading, and that's fine. They could just listen to podcasts. That's great. But if you happen to like these ideas, go to rabbolby.com forward slash newsletter, and you will be able to sign up, and it will come to your email box, please God, every Thursday. Now, my marketing people, they always chide me when I don't remind people who I am and what I do. I always assume that the audience is the same. It's our friends. These are people who know me already for a long time. And that's not always the case. Sometimes there's, often there's there's new audience, there's new people, people are listening. People don't necessarily know who this is and what to expect. So my marketing team, which really doesn't really exist, but the people that I trust and and give me marketing advice, they always say, hey, you have to sometimes periodically reintroduce yourself so everyone knows who you are, what you do, and a little bit about you. So forgive me if this is something you already know. So my name is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. I work for Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. I'm actually right now in the glorious Torch Center. And I'm fortunate enough to host six different Torah and Jewish podcasts Torah 101, the Parsha Podcast, the Jewish History Podcast, the Ethics Podcast on Perky Avos, This Jewish Life, and the Mitzvah Podcast. If you've listened to one of them, if you've sampled some of them, and you like it, maybe it's worth your while, and I encourage you to maybe sample some of the other ones. As always, my email address is rabbiwobjima.com. If you want to support my work and the wonderful work of our organization, Torch, please visit torchweb.org. So last time, we left off with a discussion about the development of Torah, we left off with the completion of the Mishnah. The Mishnah was the authoritative book, handbook, if you will, of the laws of the oral Torah. But as we mentioned last time, the Mishnah was not a complete version of oral Torah. The Mishnah is a terse, pithy, succinct delineation of oral Torah law but it's written with the barest of elaboration. The details of these laws are not written in the Mishnah, and instead they were preserved orally. So you write down the Mishnah, 
Rabbi Judah the Prince, together with his people, they spend many decades and they codify the Mishnah. 63 books divided into six different orders. We have the Mishnah. It's authoritative. It's a sealed canon. But what about all the details and all the elaboration, all the explanation of the Mishnah? That's still preserved in the oral fashion for several centuries. Several centuries later, the Talmud is written. And the Talmud is the elaboration on the Mishnah. And it's written in two versions. There is the Jerusalem Talmud, and then there is the Babylonian Talmud. Now, before we begin to talk about what the Talmud actually is, for the sake of clarity, it's important to note that the Talmud has two names. It's called Talmud, and it's called Gemara. And the reason why the same corpus has two different names is because the Talmud is written in Aramaic. But of course, the language of Torah scholarship in most time in our, of our history, for the large part of our history, is Hebrew. And therefore, there is the native name of the Talmud, which is in Aramaic. So the Aramaic name is Gemara, but the Hebrew name is Talmud. Similarly, the Mishnah also has two names. Most people don't know this. It's called the Mishnah, and it's called Masnisen. And again, the reason for that is we have a Hebrew name, Mishnah, and we have an Aramaic name, Masnisen. But because the Mishnah itself was written in Hebrew, not in Aramaic, Therefore, it's almost never called by its Aramaic name. It's almost always called by its Hebrew name, which is Mishnah. But with regard to the Talmud, we have the Aramaic name, which is Gemara, and the Hebrew name, which is Talmud. Now, it's also important to note that there's another important word that's associated with the Talmud. That is the word Shas. Now, Shas is an acronym. It stands for Shisha Sadarim, the six orders of Mishnah. So what is the Talmud? Why do we have two versions of it? What role does it play? How does it fit in to the framework of understanding the development and the canonization of oral Torah? So simply put, we say that the Talmud is the elaboration of the Mishnah. More precisely, it fills in the obvious gaps of knowledge that were deliberately omitted from the Mishnah. So, for example, the Mishnah gives a law. It doesn't tell us the origin of that law. It doesn't tell us where that law can be found in Scripture. It doesn't make the connection between the written Torah and the oral Torah. It's just a discrete law. Comes along the Talmud and says, okay, I will provide the connective tissue to understand what the source and what the reason is of the law of the Mishnah. The Talmud thus provides the connective tissue to unite the written Torah, Scripture, and the oral Torah, namely that of the Mishnah. So, for example, the first Mishnah in the book of Sukkah talks about the size of a Sukkah. How big, how tall, what's it made of, how many walls do you need, etc. So it tells us a law. One of the laws of the Oral Torah, one of the laws of the Mishnah, is that the schach, the covering, the roof of the sukkah may not be taller than 20, almost 20 cubits tall. That's the law. Very simple, one line of the Mishnah. Of course, what is not told to us in the Mishnah is why. The Mishnah is moot as to why you may not have a sukkah that's taller than 20 amos, than 20 cubits. So you open up the Talmud, first thing Talmud does is say, okay, where do we know this from? Mina hani mili. What is the source? What is the root? What is the reason of this law? So the Talmud's role is to give us, or the first role, one of the roles is to give us the reasons and the sources for the laws of the Mishnah. Mishnah is very short, very succinct. Talmud is going to elaborate. In this example, what is actually the source of this law? that the sukkah may not be more than 20 amos tall, 20 cubits tall. So the Gemara, the Talmud, gives us three different reasons. Either because the verse says that the reason why we sit in the sukkah is because we should remember what happened to the Jewish people during the Exodus. So therefore you should know when you're sitting in the sukkah that you're sitting in the sukkah. 
But if it's more than 20 cubits tall, it's 40 feet in the air, and that's where the top of the of the sukkah is, that's where the temporary covering, the temporary roof of the schach is. It's so high up, you don't look so high up, and therefore you don't know that you're sitting in a sukkah, and therefore you're not fulfilling the actual reason of the mitzvah. That's the first reason. The second reason is because if the, if the, if the schach, if the top, if the roof of the sukkah is so tall, then you're not sitting in the shade of the roof coverings, you're sitting in the shade of the panels, of the walls. And the mitzvah is that you should sit in the, in the shade of the schach, of the coverings of the top of the sukkah, and not in the shade of the walls of the sukkah. And the third opinion, says the Talmud, it's because the mitzvah of sukkah is to have a temporary dwelling. And you don't make temporary dwellings that look like skyscrapers. They're small. They're temporary. Seven days, that's it. The second you make something which is so tall, it's more than 20 almost tall, then it's not a temporary dwelling. It's a permanent dwelling, and therefore you're not fulfilling the mitzvah. So again, we see the law of the Mishnah. Very simple. The maximum height of a sukkah is... 20 amos. Comes along the Talmud and says, what's the reason? And we have three different answers to this question. But the Talmud doesn't stop there. It proceeds to burrow further and further down the rabbit hole until the very end. So we have three answers to one question. What's the reason of the Mishnah? What's the source? But then it will drill down to the root And I'll say, wait a minute, why do we need three different reasons? It must be that this sage doesn't agree with this sage, because otherwise they could just unite behind one reason. So why does sage A disagree with sage B and C and say, no, their their reasons are not sufficient, they're not good? What flaws are there in the other two arguments that necessitated you to come up with your third argument? And then it would say, well, what are the practical differences? Is there a situation where there is shade, for example, but it's still high? So you won't see it, but you'll still have the shade, so to speak. And therefore, there will be a kind of sukkah that will be okay according to one of the opinions, but not not according to the other opinions. Oh, and if you don't want to use the same verse that your colleague used, what do you do with the verse that your, that your colleague presents to furnish their argument. This is emblematic of Talmudic rigor. Mishnah is very short, direct, to the point, the law, that's it. Comes along the Talmud and leaves no stone unturned, pursues every line of questioning, drills down to the essence of disputes, is relentless in trying to find the answers to the questions. So that's the first thing Talmud does. We have the Mishnah, the laws. Okay, where's the roots? What's the source? What's the reason? And then let's get to the bottom line of that particular question. What else does the Talmud do? Another primary role of the Talmud is to ask questions on the Mishnah. The Mishnah, again, very short, very succinct. It tells us the laws. Says the Talmud, let us parse this Mishnah. Let us take the, the, the fine tooth comb and ask every question that exists on this Mishnah. And these questions, they come in a variety of forms. There are investigative questions. The Mishnah says something that's a little bit unclear. What does it mean? There are questions that are more attack questions. The Mishnah is saying something so obvious. It's unnecessary to say. Or the Mishnah is saying something that we see elsewhere. Ergo, it's redundant. The Talmud could say, oh, the Mishnah says something, but it's a little bit ambiguous. Does it apply in this case? Does it apply in that case? Or does it apply in the third case? What if there is a contradiction? How could the Mishnah say this when the verse implies otherwise? How can the Mishnah say it when there's a good reason to contest this particular law, maybe there's a contradiction from a different Mishnah. So there's a whole variety of questions that the Talmud has in its arsenal whenever it sees a Mishnah. 
Some of them are, again, just trying to figure out what, what the mission is actually saying. Maybe to, to, to define a word that can mean a, a variety of different things. Maybe it's because the case of the mission is not so clearly defined. And then there are attack questions where it seems like the law of the Mishnah is untrue or should be untrue, and therefore we have to figure out why exactly the Mishnah is saying what it's saying. The Talmud would also elaborate on the Mishnah. The Mishnah gives us a law or a process or a protocol, and says the Talmud, oh, by the way, there's some more details that go with this particular process or protocol. The Talmud will often give context to the Mishnah to explain where it's coming from. What's the background of this particular Mishnahic law? It's almost as if a Mishnah just parachutes law in from heaven and says, Talmud, okay, well, well, what do we know about this situation and where is the background from which this Mishnahic law is emanating from? The Talmud also often will fill in details that are omitted in the Mishnah. The Talmud would often qualify the Mishnah. It's true in this case, but in this case, it's not true. In which scenarios is the law of the Mishnah applicable, and in which scenarios, in which situations, is that not the case? The Talmud would also tie up loose ends of the Mishnah. The Mishnah sometimes brings a dispute, let's say, between various different sages of the Mishnahic era. And each one of them brings a proof to their point. But it's not resolved. We don't know which one of those two positions, for example, does the halacha follow? Do we follow this position or that position? Sometimes the Mishnah doesn't say. Sometimes each one is citing a proof that seems to be persuasive. So we have to reconcile these positions. And that's done in the Talmud. So we have sage one of the Mishnah saying X, sage two in the Mishnah saying Y. And each position, each sage is bringing proofs. And these proofs need to be reconciled according to the other opinion. So the dialogue of the Mishnah is unresolved and we don't know from the Mishnah alone how each one of the positions would respond to the challenge of their opponent. And that's not in the Talmud. The Talmud kind of wraps up the dialogue of the Mishnah. So that's the basic job of the Talmud, to give us all the details that we know in understanding the text of the Mishnah. And it's kind of amazing because the Mishnah typically is very short. You'll have probably, on average, somewhere between 20 to 50 times more content in a Talmudic piece than in the Mishnah that it's going on. So you have a very small Mishnah, a couple lines maybe, and then you'll have a few pages of Talmud that's only there to try to really understand what the Mishnah is saying. So again, that's the simple, basic description of what the job of the Talmud is. But once the immediate understanding of the Mishnah is complete, the Talmud will often kind of round out the law It will say, okay, let's pursue all these ancillary questions on the subject matter of the Mishnah so we know exactly all the details that we need to know about this given matter. I want to say one point that's like the most obvious thing that comes to, you know, the process of studying Talmud and Gemara, but it's a little bit of a surprise the first time you pick up on it. And that is that there is a fixed hierarchy in the Talmud and the Mishnah. What I mean by that is, you open up a book of Talmud, and because the Talmud is a commentary, is an elaboration of the Mishnah, you will actually have the text of the Mishnah followed by the text of the Talmud. And it's all found in one book. So you may think that, oh, this is just, this, this, you know, this is one book called the Talmud. But because the Talmud is a commentary, is an elaboration of the Mishnah, and the the Mishnah was sealed, was a sealed canon before the Talmud was written, it's important to, to recognize that there is this hierarchy. The Mishnah, well, that's 
higher in priority, so to speak, than the Talmud. The Talmud's here to do something else than the Mishnah. Even though they're, they're, in the, they're found in the same book, it's there to elaborate upon the Mishnah. So one of the foundations of Talmud is that if you have a teaching in the Talmud, it cannot conflict with any teaching found in the Mishnah. Because again, the Mishnah is the canon, and this is written on top of that. The Talmud has to work around, or the teachings of the Talmud have to work around the Mishnah, and not vice versa. So if you have a sage in the Talmud, and he presents a position, he offers an argument, you could right away disqualify that argument if you could prove that there is a Mishnah, any Mishnah, that disagrees with it. So very often the sages of the Talmud will present opinions and they will be attacked not based upon the logic, shall we say, of the opinion, but based upon the existing canon, namely that of the Mishnah. If you're a sage in the Talmud, you can never violate the law of a Mishnah. You can never disagree with it because you're on a different kind of plane. You're in a different strata, so to speak, in the unveiling of the oral Torah. So what happens? You have a teaching in the Talmud, and one of the sages of the Talmud presents an opinion, and then that sage and that opinion is attacked from a pre-existing Mishnah. If the teaching in the Talmud is found to be in irreconcilable conflict with a Mishnah, that is disqualifying. That's enough to discard an opinion. But there are some workarounds. If you could prove that the conflicting Mishnah, or even if you could speculate that the conflicting Mishnah is not exactly talking about the same case, the sage of the Talmud is presenting his opinion. And the conflicting sage of the Talmud is saying, no, 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 there's a Mishnah that disagrees with that. If you could prove or even suggest that no, actually the Mishnah is in a slightly different case. And therefore there is no direct conflict between the opinion of the sage of the Talmud and the quote of the cited Mishnah, then you would be able to have an out and that opinion in the Talmud will not be discarded. Alternatively, you could demonstrate that there is a Mishnahic level dispute And the author of the Talmudic teaching is not saying a universal law, is only saying their opinion according to one side of a Mishnahic level dispute. But indeed, even though you find a Mishnah that disagrees with that, but there's another Mishnah that does agree with that, and that statement of the teaching of the Talmud is limited to the position in the Mishnah that does not disagree with it. A little bit of a complicated thing, but again, the the bottom line is that there is the Mishnah, and on top of that, you have the Talmud. And the second a teaching in the Talmud diverges from its role and starts to try to jockey with the actual Mishnah itself, that is immediately disqualifying because we have the canon, and the canon is sealed, and that's the Mishnah, and on top of that comes the Talmud. And by the way, spoiler alert, the Talmud itself, once it is sealed, it too becomes a canon, and all the Torah literature that comes after it has to fit in to the pre-existing canon of both the Mishnah and of the Talmud. And thus, if you have the Rambam who comes, you know, 500 years after the Talmud is sealed, he can no longer disagree with a conclusion of the Talmud. And again, we'd have to work around, you know, how does the Rambam disagree with the Talmud. This is one of the most joyous activities that we do in yeshiva. You take a teaching from the, from the Rambam, and you take a corresponding teaching in the Talmud, and you say, wait a minute, I'm reading this, I'm reading this, and they're, they're in conflict. But they can't be in conflict, because the Rambam knew the Talmud a lot better than you will ever know it, that we know for sure. And if you question that, it just means you're not familiar enough with the information or with the people involved. So the Rambam knew this Talmud better than you know it. Yet, yet, he writes a position that there's no way that you could see to reconcile the two. And what your job is to say, what your job to do, so to speak, is 
to either find a different teaching in the Talmud that the, that the Rambam is going with, or you have to try to figure out how the Rambam studied this Talmud in a different way than you did. And therefore, your understanding is not jiving with the Rambam's understanding, and you have to try to reverse engineer what his opinion would be in how to read this Talmud. That's the task in front of you. Again, we're getting to very advanced levels, but it's the same principle that there is that hierarchy. So again, that's the basic role of Talmud, to further explain, elaborate upon the laws of the Mishnah. But beyond merely addressing the laws of the Mishnah, the Talmud is written in a way that it often gets sidetracked, if you will. It goes off on tangents. There are digressions from the actual text of the Mishnah. And sometimes it's even actually hard to follow what is the connection between successive topics called sudyas in Talmudic parlance, like how did we get from talking about this to suddenly talking about this for a couple of pages. So one common way that it's done is that the Talmud is trying to parse out a, a, a Mishnah and it's bringing all kinds of sources and questions and laws and it's really getting deep into the subject matter. And it will bring a teaching, often a beraisa, a very important word to know. Beraisa is a Mishnahic era teaching that is not featured in the Mishnah. It could be a Tosefta, it could be something else, uh, just an unattributed Braisa. But the Talmud will feature a Braisa in its attempt to try to understand the Mishnah. And that Braisa is related, is germane to the subject matter of the Mishnah. But once that's done, the Talmud, the Gemara, will often pick up on something in the citation that is not related to the subject matter at hand, and the Talmud would probe it further. So again, we have a subject matter, it's based upon a Mishnah, and we're bringing all kinds of sources to understand the Mishnah, but there's something in one of these sources that catches our eye. And once we're done with the, the job to be done, the task at hand... Let's spend some time in this Brysa that we just cited and try to understand it on its own. So it's almost like the, the subject matter, that the topic changes based upon the citation that is brought. And by the way, the commentaries will often explain what the connection is between seemingly unrelated teachings. Another way that this is done, the Talmud, one of the hallmarks of the Talmud is that it always attributes the origin of a certain teaching. So it's very common. You open up a Talmud, Rabbi so-and-so, the son of Rabbi so-and-so, said in the name of Rabbi so-and-so. Who said in the name of Rabbi so-and-so? Oh, and other people say that, no, it wasn't Rabbi so-and-so in the name of Rabbi so-and-so. It was Rabbi so-and-so in the name of Rabbi so-and-so. It's very careful, very fastidious to try to figure out exactly what the origin of teachings and traditions are. That's just the Talmudic convention. But often, this is a segue to a digression. If it brings a particular formulation, Rabbi X, in the name of Rabbi Y, who said something in this kind of context, sometimes what the Talmud will do, which is kind of bunch together all the teachings that have that same formulation, Rabbi X, in the name of Rabbi Y, who said, you know, in this kind of way, and I'll say, you know, four or five completely unrelated teachings, but because they have the same attribution, the Talmud just lumps them all together. And that is the connection. Again, there's not a, a topical connection, but, but there is, uh, the connection between the, the, the author of that given statement. So we'll just bunch them together. That happens a lot. Okay. So we understand the basic bare bones of what Talmud needs to do and a little bit about how it does it. But like we mentioned earlier, there are two versions of the Talmud. You have the Babylonian Talmud, Talmud Bavli, and you have the Jerusalem Talmud, the Talmud Yerushalmi. When people say Talmud, and they don't tell you which Talmud they're referring to, invariably, they are referring to the Babylonian Talmud, which, as its name suggests, was written in Babylon. 
in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in modern-day Iraq. The Jerusalem Talmud, you may think, was written in Jerusalem. It was actually not written in Jerusalem. At the time, the time that was written, Jews were barred from living in Jerusalem. It was, in fact, written in northern Israel in Tiberias. Now, these two versions of Talmud were written more than 100 years apart from each other. This is at the time where the center of Jewish life is transitioning from Israel to Babylon. Again, this is, we're talking about somewhere between 200 to 400 years after the temple's been, destro- after the temple's been destroyed. So a way to think about what's happening over here. Again, we're omitting a lot of details, but just to understand the big picture. Rabbi Judah the Prince is the redactor of the Mishnah. He lives in Israel. At the time when he lives, the nexus, the epicenter of Jewish life, of, of the sages and the academies, is in Israel. He has three major students that are at the vanguard of the next stage, so to speak, of oral Torah. And that is the Talmud. The Mishnah is sealed. Now it's time to formulize and finalize and codify the Talmud. That's going to take really 300 years to do until it's finished. These three students are called Rav, Shmuel, and Rav Yochanan. Rav, Shmuel, and Rav Yochanan. Rav and Shmuel, after they study under Rabbi the Prince, they move to Babylon. And in Babylon, they found academies. These are called the academies of Sura and Neherda, which eventually moves to a city called Pumpadisa. These academies were the largest Talmudic academies in the world, and they lasted for 800 years until the year 1038 when these academies finally closed. Rav Yochanan, the third student, he remained in Israel and he headed the academies in Israel. So we have this time period, think of the year 200 to the year 300 or so, where there's two flourishing Torah worlds, one in Israel and one in Babylon. Occasionally, the students and the sages would travel from one to the other. And there's all kinds of stories in the Talmud. Oh, when Rav Dimi came, we asked him all these questions. Because what would happen? It's a pretty long journey. And it's a very perilous one to travel from Israel to Babylon. So when someone would do it, it would be a rare occurrence. And everyone's trying to get all the news they could get out of the civilization out of the communities of the place that they came from. So the Talmud very often gives us the laws that were transmitted, kind of sharing the laws between Israel and Babylon when the sages would travel from one to the other. So we have Rav Yochanan in Israel. His two colleagues are in Babylon, Rav and Shmuel. And Rav Yochanan in Israel, he begins the process of writing the first version of Talmud, which is known as the Jerusalem Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud doesn't get written until much later. The students of the students of the students of the students of Rav and Shmuel, a legendary pair of sages called Ravina and Rav Ashi, they wrote the second version of the Talmud known as the Babylonian Talmud. So the obvious question is, wait a minute, Talmud, there's a job to get done, and it's done. Why was the Talmud written twice? You go to a well-stocked Jewish library, you'll find two sets of books, Jerusalem Talmud, Babylonian Talmud. Why do we have to have both? Why is this very laborious process done twice? Question number one. Question number two, what are the differences between the two? What's the difference between the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud? And more specifically, why do we favor the later version of the Talmud, namely the Babylonian Talmud, in lieu of the earlier version of the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud? Typically, we think, you know, the earlier, the better. Mishnah is earlier, and therefore it has priority over Talmud. So we have the Jerusalem Talmud that's written earlier, 
yet we favor the later version of the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. So just to understand exactly what Jerusalem Talmud is, what Babylonian Talmud is. After the writing of the Mishnah, the plan was to keep all the other stuff, all the elaboration on the Mishnah, all the stuff that we call Talmud, to keep it oral. It was going to be maintained in the oral format. But eventually it became clear to all that just as there was a necessity to codify the Mishnah, there was a necessity to codify the Talmud. It had to be written. And indeed, in Israel, under the leadership of Rav Yochanan, the Jerusalem Talmud was written. Now, to be clear, this is not a one-man project. Rav Yochanan did not write it himself. He initiated the project, but it was a collaborative effort of several generations before it was completed. But the conditions under which the Jerusalem Talmud was written and the style in which it was written, they were not ideal and therefore was necessary to have the Babylonian Talmud, that project done. And that's why we favor the Babylonian Talmud because it is a better version of Talmud than the Jerusalem Talmud. And here's why. The Jews living in Israel at that time, they were subject to very hostile treatment. The Romans were increasing their persecution. There was an uptick of religious persecution by the nascent Christians. And of course, in due course, those two will merge. There was also abject poverty in Israel at the time. And there were instances where the rabbis and the Torah communities were targeted. For example, there was a wanton slaughter of the entire Jewish community of Tsipori, where all the sages lived, and in Tiberias, the major city in northern Israel. So the Jerusalem Talmud was essentially never fully finished. It was never edited. Because the entire team that was working on this monumental project, the entire team was slaughtered. It's not clear if it was intended to be revised and rewritten and polished. But regardless, it was unfinished and written in a way that demanded that the project be undertaken again. So 100 to 150 years after the Jerusalem Talmud is done, the Babylonian Talmud was written, as we said, under the auspices of Ravina and Rav Ashi and completed by Mar, son of Rav Ashi, and further polished and refined by a generation of sages known as the Rabbanan Savorai. So think of it from the year 500 to the year 570 or so. Now, Rav Ashi is considered one of the great legends of Jewish history. And the Talmud puts him on this pantheon with Moses and Rabbi Judah the Prince. Moses, of course, he writes down the written Torah. He gives us all the oral Torah in the oral fashion, the oral format. Comes Lord Rabbi the Prince and he codifies, canonizes the Mishnah. And three years later comes Lord Ravashi and he canonizes, codifies the Talmud. And these three people were told they are the only people that had the qualities needed to undertake and to complete such a project. They had Torah greatness, the greatest Torah sage of their time, and they also had other greatness. They had the political power. They had the the proper conditions needed for such a project to be undertaken. And they also had the financial wherewithal to support the tremendous costs of such an operation. At the time, in Babylon, the rulers were relatively friendly and tolerant to such an effort being undertaken. Rav Ashi was a man of tremendous wealth and power, but also someone who lived a very long life and had a life and leadership of unprecedented stability. He was the head of an academy for 60 years. And during that time, he wrote the Talmud and polished it, and rewrote it and re-edited it and repolished and refined it, and that was done Twice. There's essentially 60 books, and every year they would do two books, and they did it twice. So 30 years was one go-through, 
and then 30 years was a second go through, and thus we have a highly polished product. This is a monumental project to assemble and to organize and to edit all the material of the preceding generations. He's quoting sages, Rav, Shmuel, people that lived hundreds of years before him, but all of it was collected and organized because, again, these were all part of the oral traditions, can collected, organized, systematized, and divided up into sections and organized upon each chapter of Mishnah. Every question that's unresolved, let's resolve it. Laying out and arranging the sequence of the Talmud. And then his students, they take the project, and his, primarily his son, whose name was Mar, Mar, the son of Ravashi, and the Rabbanan Savoroi, they further polish it, further uh, made sure that the, the system of language and syntax is organized and is uniform, And the result is astonishing. It's 37 books. It's really essentially four orders of Mishnah. The order of Zeraim that deals with agriculture is only one book of Talmud that was written on it. And the last order, the order of Taharos, is only one book written on that one. And today when we talk about Talmud, 99.9% of all Talmud that's studied is Babylonian Talmud. All the great commentaries wrote their commentaries exclusively on the Babylonian Talmud. When we find a dispute between the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, we invariably follow the Babylonian Talmud. And there's many reasons for it. Like we said, the project was completed. The editing was completed. It was finished. It was polished. The language was made uniform. It seems likely that the language of the Jerusalem Talmud was deliberately designed to be hard to understand, and therefore the Babylonian Talmud is clearer. And again, you would understand why they would make it hard to understand. Because again, this whole notion of writing down the oral Torah, it's anathema. How could you write down the oral Torah? It's supposed to be oral. Well, let's write down the minimum that's needed. And let's leave so much opacity and obscurity that you really have to have a teacher. You have to have some sort of tradition. You have to follow the guidance of a leader, of a of a sage, in order to understand it. Whereas with the Babylonian Talmud, less of a focus was made on obscuring as much as it was made an effort on revealing the loss. Moreover, there were more sages working on the Babylonian Talmud project than on the Jerusalem Talmud project. The Babylonian Talmud project was written with more peace of mind. It was also later And therefore, it was able to include more information from more sages over more time. It's also more comprehensive. And finally, the format is done in a dialogue fashion almost, where we have the opinions that will ultimately be discarded, but we go through the very rigorous process of figuring out why these opinions must be disqualified and discarded. And therefore, it's much more of an alive process. The the stories and the narratives and the dialogue is jumping out at you and you almost feel like you're reliving the debates of the great academies of Babylon. That said, there are many aspects of Jewish life There's many laws and customs that we follow that only find their origin in the Jerusalem Talmud. In fact, there's many books of Talmud written in the Jerusalem Talmud version that we don't have the corresponding book in the Babylonian Talmud version. Now again, there's 63 books of Mishnah. Only 37 of them have a Babylonian Talmud written upon it. There are many books, namely the entire set of Zira'im, of the agricultural laws, with the exception of Brachos. You have the entire order. You have the Jerusalem Talmud version, but not the Babylonian Talmud version. And in Seder Moed, you have the book of Shkalim, but there's only a Jerusalem Talmud version of it and not a Babylonian Talmud version of it. 
So again, we still accord that the Jerusalem Talmud tremendous honor and distinction in the Jewish library. And if you find a law in the Jerusalem Talmud that's not disputed by the Babylonian Talmud, it is indeed authoritative. But in general, when we talk about Talmud, we refer to the Babylonian Talmud. And today you'll find that the Babylonian Talmud consists of, like we said, 37 books, 2,711 pages. If you have a beginner who's never studied Talmud before, but they have a good mind, a sharp mind, it would take him legitimately an hour to understand a few lines of Talmud because it's written with such density and such intricateness that there's really nothing that you have in the world that's like that. There's no other book that you could open and say, you really, just a few lines of it, you really need to spend an hour. But even accomplished students, they could struggle over a piece of Talmud for hours and hours until they understand it. Today, there is a project that was launched in the 1920s called the Daf Yomi Project. Daf means page, a page of Talmud. Yomi means daily, a daily page of Talmud. And there are probably hundreds of thousands of people in the world that are part of this program where they study a page of Talmud a day. Now, to study a page of Talmud a day, it's, it's a, an incredible amount of material. You have to necessarily do it on a more surface level. But even if you study a page of Talmud a day, it takes you seven and a half years to finish it. This is a gargantuan amount of content and of knowledge. The corpus is just astounding. And again, I'm not saying this hyperbolically. If you've never studied Talmud, and you pick up any page of Talmud, doesn't matter which page it is, drop you in the middle of a, of a, of a discussion, or even start from the beginning, start from a Mishnah. Get through a half a page just to see what it's like, just to see what this obsession of the Jewish people, again, we're talking about 1,500 years ago, this, this book was sealed. We're dealing with a very ancient set of books, yet it's studied today maybe more than it ever was, maybe. I don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to make that kind of assessment. But people are still obsessed with it. And you go to yeshiva and you see a thousand people vigorously studying Talmud. And you wonder why the Jews are so sharp? This is the answer. Because we spent generations breaking our heads over Talmud. It's the world's, I, I call it the world's best pencil sharpener for your brain. Because it forces you to think critically and logically. You see these yeshiva students with not much of a secular education do really well in business, do really well in law school. Why? Because they're, they're, they're trained. They're, they're superpowers that they have that they picked up. They don't even know they have. They picked up because they study Talmud. Just an incredible thing that we have. Now, we talk about it being very hard to study. It is hard. But there are many ways that it has actually gotten easier. For the first roughly thousand years of the Talmud, every copy had to be handwritten. Today, of course, it's beautifully printed. Over the course of our history, there have been many times when the study of Talmud was banned. There were book burnings of Talmud, most famously 1244 in Paris. They burnt 24 wagonfuls of Talmud. Now, as a result of a millennium of hand-copying Talmuds, there were, understandably, variant texts in a Talmud. So, for example, two of the most common sages that you find in the pages of the Talmud are Rava and Rabba. Rava and Rabba, which names sound kind of similar, but their spellings are almost identical. So, as you might imagine, it happens occasionally, that the text reads Rava, but really it should say Rava, or vice versa. It reads Rava, but it really should say Rava. So that is a difficulty that thankfully we don't have to 
worry about because there were people who dedicated their lives to make the emendations to the text to remove all the vestiges of erroneous text. So today we actually have the correct text of the Talmud. Moreover, if you study Talmud, let's say 1,500 years ago, the year 700 or something like that, you study Talmud, you would not have the aid of Rashi. Rashi is a student of Talmud's best friend because he's holding your hands and watching you through every step of the Gemara, of the Talmud. There's a word you don't know, he'll give you the definition. There's some background information that you need, he'll give it to you. What's the question? What's the answer? What's the logic of the question? What's the logic of the answer? What is the Talmud's current assumption that will later be rejected? Rashi is there to help you at every stage of understanding the Talmud. He'll give you all the information you need, and critically, he'll give you none of the information that you don't need. You have the Vilna Shas. Of course, there's been many versions of printing of the Shas, the Sonsino edition, various other editions. The Vilna Shas, done in the really 1800s or so, that's the gold standard. You have the inclusion of amazing commentaries in the back and the margins, the Rosh, the Marsha, the Rif. You'll have the sources of the citations. The Talmud, for example, quotes a verse. Where's that verse? Talmud quotes another Mishnah. Where's that Mishnah? Where else do we find in the Talmud this particular citation? Where do we find the related laws in the Rambam, the Shulchan Aruch? And today, in modern times, we have the new editions of the Talmud that are just incredible, like the Art Scroll edition, the Schottenstein edition, an absolute masterpiece of elucidation of the Talmud. We have the Steinsaltz edition. Uh, today, they now print Talmuds with punctuation and with Nikudot. It's never been easier to study Talmud. And of course, with the absolute explosion of the Dafyomi, there's more people studying Talmud today, maybe than ever before. I had the great privilege of going on January 1st to MetLife Stadium in New York and to uh, participate in the Siyama Shas, the conclusion of the, of the Talmud. 90,000 people, one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I was, able to take my, I was able to take my son also as well, my son Yoshua. It's just unbelievable. And now we know why the Talmud is so popular. It's the authoritative version of the Oral Torah. It is what elucidates, what explains, what elaborates upon the laws of the Mishnah. But the truth is, there's much more in the Talmud than what we've discussed. We've described the most basic, the most basic bare bones, surface level framework of what the Talmud is. The truth is that there are depths upon depths upon depths in every page of Talmud. There are yeshivos that they spend legitimately an entire six-month semester and they only cover about two to three pages of Talmud. They just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into it. The fastest in-depth Talmudic lecture in the world is the one that I attended to. It was in Rabbi Asher Yeli's lecture in the Mir Yeshiva in Jerusalem. This is the fastest in the world. Again, the fastest of its kind in the world out of probably hundreds or thousands of them. In a six-month semester, they would cover between 20 and 30 pages of Talmud. And I assure you that we're not dealing with slow people and we're not dealing with untalented people and we're not dealing with unmotivated people. We're dealing with people who are working on the absolute peak of scholarship that exists in the world today. There is so, so, so much depth. But I think we have maybe a, a framework to understand what it's all about. But the truth is that we've only really covered, even in our framework, we've only covered about half of the Talmud. Half of the Talmud is the explanation of the laws of the Mishnah. The other half of the Talmud is what's known as the Agadita, which is translated 
simply as the non-legal portions of the Talmud. So you have the ethical, historical, theological, philosophical, medicinal parts of the Talmud. The parts where the Talmud talks about the narratives of the Torah, the narratives, the stories, the personalities of Scripture. What the Agadita is and what it means and how it's studied, it's an entirely different element of Talmud. And we're going to have to dedicate an entire episode to figure out exactly what the Agadita is. In addition, just as was the case with the Mishnah, the writing of the Talmud was also done in a way that maintains part of it in the oral fashion. So the Mishnah is written just to bare bones, and the Talmud has to be oral. The Talmud is written, and now what we have left is to figure out what the halacha is. Because what the Talmud does not do is give you the bottom line. The bottom line, the halacha, what you need to do once it's all done, that remained oral. And therefore, the next wave of the codification of oral Torah is when the halacha is written, and how exactly halacha emerges from the Talmud is another subject that demands our attention as well. But again, more broadly speaking, what are we trying to do? We're talking about Torah. And I feel like if we're going to make an assessment of Torah, if we're going to have an opinion of Torah, it's important for us to know what that means. We spoke about the written Torah a little bit, the oral Torah, the development of the oral Torah, and the codification of the oral Torah, the Mishnah, now the Talmud, and we still have a ways to go before we even kind of have just a basic layout of what it even means when we say the word Torah. But now we know, I think, a little bit about what the Talmud means, the Jerusalem Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, and how these projects were done, and what is the role of the Talmud in elaborating upon the Mishnah and giving us much more details of a Mishnah Klaw. As always, my email address is rabbilomjibba.com. I look forward to any questions, any comments, and any of your feedback.